the sun. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is some work that was done last year at Galwa, and before last year was on sabbatical. And uh, let me tell you about a very worrying uh, problem about software engineering. <laughs> Almost all programs have parts of that program that you can reach, but you haven't tested. So diagrammatically, if you think of your source code as the gray area or anything inside the circle, there's parts of it that are library code. That's okay if you use a set library and you haven't done every single possible set operation. That's just fine. There'll still be parts there. There'll be parts that you have tested. You've run some test code. But there'll be parts that you could conceptually or possibly reach, but you haven't tested. And this talk is about trying to identify that yellow part and trying to see if there's changes we can make to uh, shrink that yellow part or identify the, the problems inside there. So, when you uh, write an application at Haskell, there's basically two ways of testing it or, or two different approaches that go on. This is actually not unique to Haskell. Any application has this. Uh, you can think of it like an application you can run it from the front door. Be it, if it's a Unix application, you might run it as a command line and try different arguments, try a few error cases. Uh, one thing that, uh, in my experience, often happens is that things like the help command or built-in help are never actually tested by the test suite. They're just tested by hand. Sometimes the boundary cases, this thing accepts n different files, or does it accept zero files? What actually happens in that case? These cases are often neglected by the tests. There's also a different side of testing that can be done. And that's running uh, in Haskell quick, quick check style tests, which are fantastic for pinning down uh, properties and getting you thinking about your program. But how much is enough? When do you know that you've actually tested your program? In a, in a, uh, how do you know you've actually covered all the different permutations of your program? Uh, what I want to talk about today is how much of that question can we answer automatically. Uh, and we're going to use code coverage to help us make that assessment. So, in, uh, in code coverage, code coverage is something that's been around, I don't actually know uh, the first reference to it, but it's been around in engineering, it's software engineering for many, many years. Uh, there are basically uh, four different types of uh, uh, code coverage. The first type is function-based, which is conceptually really simple. Did I ever call this function when I was running my test or running this application? And uh, most languages have some support for that. There's also decision coverage, which is if I had a choice to make of going left or going right, did I actually go left and go right at some point? Obviously not at the same time, but in one run did I go left, another run did I go, did I go right. There's also line-based coverage, which is did I execute this line of code well, what does that mean in Haskell? We'll, we'll come back to that. And there's also path coverage, which is a more advanced feature of traditional coverage tools. When if you get a, a, you get a choice to go left and right, and then you have a merge point, and you have a choice to go left and right again, did you go all permutations through, this, uh, through the path? So that's, that's the sort of one slide summary of uh, code coverage of traditional inherited languages. What Colin and I did, was think about how we can map that sort of technology across onto Haskell. Well, function entries is actually quite easy to map across. We have functions in Haskell. Even CAFs, even uh, top-level functions with no arguments, can also be uh, thought of as, have you used this? Uh, for decisions, we have conditionals or switches in, in C. Well, we have conditions, we have guards, qualifiers. We can map all these things across. We also have case and pattern match. Uh, we have a one-to-one -one or one-to-end correspondence, but we have a correspondence. But what does it mean to execute a specific line in Haskell? There isn't that concept of being at a particular line at a particular point. In path coverage, uh, we're working in a purely functional <coughs> language. What does it mean to go one path and a different path? There's no state to update. I mean, I'm ignoring here the, uh, obviously you can write imperative programs in Haskell. But there's no state to update. So, what Colin and I decided is let's push the idea of entering a function all the way down to every single sub-expression in your program. 
So every argument, every if you have 1 plus 2, both 1 and 2 and the plus are uh, marked, and we ask the question, did you enter or use this particular part of that program? And we'll uh, take that idea, find out how inefficient it is, and run with it. So in Haskell, we've mapped the function based across, just directly across. We, uh, we have the alternatives. We have Boolean coverage, which is, uh, says if something like a, uh, something like a pattern guard, uh, something like a guard, is it always true or always false? So if a conditional is always one value, then perhaps you haven't tested that program as thoroughly as you should. And then we have this expression level, which because we have a lazy functional language, we can uh, answer questions like, have you ever used this particular sub-expression? Here's the frightening thing. If you haven't used a sub-expression, you could put undefined there, and you'd have exactly the same result on all the tests you've run so far. There's, the code is doing no, uh, adding no value to, the, to your program at that particular point. That's what we want to avoid. Uh, and this, this is comparable with, uh, with traditional uh, uh, coverage, uh, path coverage tools. So I want to give you a demo. <coughs> Let's see if this works. Okay. So, uh, and this is a live demo. So, and it worked last night. Let's see what happens. <laughs> uh, so, we grabbed uh, GHC 6.8. Uh, we're compiling a, pro a program called main. And I'll use minus minus make out of habit. Uh, this is it was one file, so you would, don't actually need to do this. But, uh, so how do you take this way of compiling a program and turn it into a program that has been instrumented for coverage? That's it. All you have to do. And uh, uh, I'll talk later about how fast or slow it runs. Uh, the speed here, I would argue, is a reflection of my laptop more than a reflection of the translation. Uh, we're going ahead, we've compiled it. What program did we compile? Well, let's have a... A quick look here, and I suppose I should drag it across as well, otherwise uh, you can't see. Okay, so uh, as a simple example, and the, and the idea here isn't to understand the specifics of the Haskell uh, uh, contained in this file. It's just to understand it's a Haskell program with a few subtleties in it. Uh, when we're teaching Haskell or, or helping people understand Haskell at Galwa, this is one of the examples that we use. It's an example that takes a textual input and chops up the words according to lines and then reconstitute them uh, to be a formatted paragraph. And that seems like quite a simple problem, but there's very subtleties you can bring in. Do you, do you chop words, uh, can you chop words in half with, uh, with hyphen between them, for example? Can you add that functionality? So we start with a, a trivial example, which is just <coughs> words and words, which is no layer at all and gradually build up and, and introduce more functionality. So the idea here isn't to understand all this, but it's, a, it's, it's quite an involved example. Uh, we have added one bit of sparks here saying, if you end with ing, then you can use a suffix in that particular place. And uh, the question is, when we're running this program, how do we know uh, what parts of the code I mean, I mean actually executed and what parts haven't. So we'll use, so this, this was the main file that I compiled. So if we go ahead and use, uh, if we run it, uh, let me just check if we've got the right here. 50. So this is the uh, first paragraph of the, the Haskell report. Uh, we can see it's justified to 50. I haven't actually counted, so we got another bug in there. Uh, and it's spaced them and it's put extra spaces in to try, uh, to try justify these paragraphs uh, that are there. So we've actually done, this is, this is uh, successfully justified a paragraph. How much of the program has been uh, actually covered? Well, let's, let's try this. So this is the, uh, the simplest way of using this tool. Is we're, we've gone ahead and run it. It's got all the way some information. We're now going
going to get that information. HPC is a tool for doing so. And it's telling us that 96% of our code was run. On an expression level, there were six sub-expressions that were never entered. Bit strange. Where are they? What's going to happen? Well, obviously, you need some way of actually presenting this information. So, so you go ahead, uh, you use a different mode of the HPC tool. And let's see. Uh, this is a trivial summary because only one, one file. But what we can see here, we look at it, uh, and it's, it's a slightly different format. So we see if we can do that to make it all fit in one place. What we can see is we do have a couple examples where we're green, where all was true. Well, otherwise, always is going to be true. So one of the rules we had was uh, no exceptions. Let's go ahead and apply this technology deep and, and not uh, have any corner cases. And then we'll work out where the strange things happen. So what happens in pattern guard is an evaluation order. You try this one, then you try this one, then you try this one. So provided the program has never uh, um, had an error because it's gone, it, it, none of these have matched. Obviously, otherwise, it's going to, it's going to match. The, the, obviously, the last pattern is going to be true. And otherwise, it's trivially true because it's defined as true. Uh, down here, we can see the suffix program. It was always true. But this is actually a precondition on this function. You're checking that this is true. Uh, so that's, that's fine. But where, the, where is the program never actually been executed? Well, in three places. You've never actually used the result here. There's a couple of different places and up there. So what the next stage, and this is, this is part of your job as an engineer, is saying, why was that never done? What actually never happened? Uh, so one of the places that never happened was we never tried it on an empty input. Another place that never happened was we never tried it on uh, a code where the, the required line width was so small that it couldn't match it. And the other place is we never actually tried our ING abilities. We went ahead and computed what happened, but we never actually rendered one with that. Uh, so let's go ahead and... And we can see here, this one had an ink here. So let's... Run that. You can see now, this place down here and this place up there. It's, it's told us that you no longer have to, uh, yeah, that, that is now at least executed at least once by your program. And uh, you can go ahead and try the thinner example. You can go ahead and try the, uh, actually, let's do that and do a report. Now 100%. So you've now got the ability to take a Haskell program, see how much of it was actually used, figure out from these parts how to actually get to that place in the code, run some more tests and see if that actually happens. And uh, um, let me finish with that demo. Let, let me finish with that demo there. Well, let, uh, let me show you something else. <coughs> One question, of course, is do you eat your own dog food? Well, here's some live data of the coverage tool itself. The coverage tool consists of uh, changes to the compiler uh, or a um, source, source translator and a back-end tool that does that processing to write the HTML. Well, here's the output from actually trying to bootstrap the thing, testing how well you're using it itself. And some parts of it uh, the report, this is the code that implements report, this is the code that implements markup. And we can see uh, they're in the high 90s. There's a few holes, but in the high 90s. And there's other parts that, uh, of more recent facilities that seem really low. The uh, HPC Lexer, we're seeing it's down in the 50s. So we look at the HPC Lexer and see why that's the case. Like last time, we can now go in, we can see, well, what's happened is, that, is the main functionality seems to have been used, but there's entire places where it's never been used. Uh, standard Lexer, uh, go ahead, you've got a digit call, a Lexer for int. When your Lexer for int, 
well, and this, this is digit was always false. What does that mean? Well, it's only ever been tested on integers that are one character long. That's what this means. So we have to up our tests uh, and, uh, and try more testing. So the point here isn't this thing isn't finished. Uh, the, the, the point here is we've got the information to add more tests to systematically find what we've actually gone through and, uh, and tested our entire program. Uh, any questions before I, uh, I move on? No? Okay. So what we have is we have a version of uh, GHC, GHC 681, has HPC uh, built in. There's also a Haskell to Haskell translator that will be Haskell Prime compliant. Right now it is Haskell 98 plus a few extensions. And there's a command line tool which has a dark style interface. So you can, uh, uh, you can also put help that will give you help about a particular command. And this is for processing the data afterwards. It can give you marked up code. It can give you information, uh, both in ASCII and an XML mode as well. And then you go into, uh, into all, the, all the modes. The uh, intermediate f uh, formats are trivial. They're shows of the Haskell data types. And that's intentional. Because that processing isn't the labor intensive, <coughs> time consuming part. You have to make sure that when you run your program, that runs as fast as possible and as optimized as much as possible. But the offline parts are, are not expensive. And other tools can use, can use this data. And this scales to huge Haskell programs. We we'll run it in programs, uh, uh, GHC and other uh, large programs that are uh, uh, 10K, uh, sorry, 100K plus lines. We we'll run it on our, uh, one of our internal Gala projects that has a very complicated build system with uh, maybe a dozen, half a dozen to a dozen different packages that are compiled in different ways with different options and they're all merged together at the last point. Uh, we can successfully uh, cover there. You can also, when you have a library that's not compiled with HPC, you can mix and match seamlessly. So, next question. What's the overhead here? What, what does it cost to do this? Well, uh, we'd rather than take the traditional MoFIP uh, test suite, uh, the idea here isn't to get a number like you know 1.4 or 9.7. The idea here is to get a feel for how much it's costing you as a programmer. So I took some examples from the NoFib uh, suite. But I also took some larger examples, some larger exa uh, uh, programs like Darks and GHC itself. And the overhead, and then I tried it uh, with optimization and without optimization. So what this is telling you is that uh, with optimization, the primes is just a bit slower than uh, with, uh, with, the, with the instrumentation than without. Uh, and you can see that, that what we're talking about is somewhere between uh, 1.1 and 2, with the exception of GHC itself, when it's optimized. And I think that's because the inners of GHC use a lot of unboxing and they're unique numbers. And uh, that part isn't quite as heavily optimized when we have coverage. So, <coughs> That gives us a picture of where we are with the, with the uh, runtime overhead. For the compile time overhead, uh, it's less than two, uh, basically, with one exception, Anna. I, I don't actually know uh, why this was so much larger, but it wasn't just a, a fluke of the measuring. This happened, uh, this happened reliably. But uh, for most programs, it was shown a factor of, uh, of under two. A completely acceptable overhead for what the tool offers you. The intention isn't to run with this tool every time. The intention is to run with this tool as a special mode for doing testing. So how does this thing work? What's underneath the surface? Well, what it does is it takes a function call or, 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 or a fragment of Haskell, uh, typically applications, and adds ticks random. A tick is a benign function that is numbered. <coughs> and uh, in the source to source translator, tick is implemented using unsafe perform IO. Uh, inside GHC, tick is, a, tick is implemented using uh, an extension to GHC's AST. And it pushes all the way through GHC. It turns into a uh, case at the core level. And uh, in core, case is strict. So all this is saying is make sure you call tick before you do the rest of the function. And if this seems really simple, it is that simple. 
We're really just wrapping every sub-expression with a call to tick. And there's a way of mapping these numbers. Uh, this is a simplified picture. There's a way of map mapping these numbers uh, back to the original source location. There's a table that's stored in the file that says, for this particular number three, well, actually, that it's this particular location in this particular file. And right at the back end, we use 64 bits and increment 64 bits. Uh, from the math uh, and, and, looking, and looking at how long it takes to overflow 64 bits, we're quite a ways of over, overlapping that. And at that point, we'll rewrite it to 128 bits. So uh, we've used this for about a year now, and it's been maturing all the time. So what's our uh, experience for using it? Well, it really made us think about when we test programs, we're really testing two different views of a program. One of them using quick check, and one of them using uh, the front door of an application. And uh, what modules do they share in common? What modules do they have distinct? It really made us start to think about that particular, uh, uh, that particular issue. Um, where HPC helps you is if you write a quick check property and it looks like even the coverage is great for your program, it can tell you, well, this quick check property was actually inadequate. Actually, there was a whole part of this that you intended to try the semantics of, but you never actually tried the semantics of. So you're actually getting three types of coverage. You're getting the coverage of the application run as an application. You're getting the coverage of an application uh, through its unit tests, and you get the coverage of the unit tests themselves and what you intended to, uh, to test. When you look at your program, you often see places where there's dead code. And it's, uh, it, in some ways it's embarrassing, in other ways it's like, oh, I can see what's, what's going on there and what's, and what's happening. And it, and it encourages you to just rip that out. And, uh, source code should be version controlled, so you should be able to just delete it and move on. It, it does encourage, it does actively encourage refactoring. Uh, if I go ahead and refactor uh, uh, two different examples of that from two different engineers. Uh, one engineer was saying he refactored one function to use another one specifically, so he so only had to taste one function to get coverage. Uh, in another case, there was a table that had a hole in it where there were undefined parts. They were explicitly undefined in the table. The engineer realized it would never be evaluated, but it was rewritten use a different type, so that wouldn't happen. Uh, another way of thinking about, or sort of summarizing uh, what's going on is quick check lets you think about your successes, about this particular function is this wonderful property, and look how it holds. Well, HPC gives you a sanity check, and it lets you realize that you've actually got some failures inside there. So I was trying to think, and I couldn't think of a, 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 an actor, but you think about their successes, and uh, um, uh, you also want to be, you, um, as an actor, they're also reminded of their failures in the films they starred in that were just completely hopeless. So this is serving the same, the same purpose, which is, yes, you can see what you're doing right, but look, you've actually forgotten to test these particular cases. And that's important, because this application is going out in the field and you want it to actually work. And getting 100% is actually really difficult. And that's, that's my experience, is even with a lot of motivation to try and do there. The HTC tool itself still hasn't reached 100%. There is a tool that has reached 100%, and we'll be talking about that, uh, a demo for that later. Uh, so I'm going to jump to my, uh, my summary here. We have a high fidelity coverage tool. It, it generates what I think is state of the art information, and both at Galo and the wider community, we're starting to use it. Uh, we have found some small bugs. We haven't yet found the killer bug through HPC. As an engineer, I've come across places many times when some piece of code has finally been executed, and you look at it and you go, what was I thinking? This obviously doesn't work. It's just got the wrong mindset inside there. So I don't know. We haven't come across that code yet with HPC. It's just a matter of time, I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, it, Xmonad is going to require 100% coverage before check-ins uh, in the near future, which is, which is very exciting for, uh, for HPC. And this technology is getting reused, which is probably the most exciting part for me, is that the problems that are getting addressed inside the HPC are reusable in different places. One is the next talk, uh, part of the uh, mechanism used uh, by the debugger with the HPC technology. And another is we now have the ability to count how often you enter particular expressions and sub-expressions. 
And that's going to be useful for optimizers, and that's also going to be useful for uh, uh, various other tools or, 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 uh, or manipulators. Uh, okay, that's the end of my talk. Any questions? So, uh, other coverage tools I've used use one bit per tick point. And you've chosen to use 64 bits per tick point. Can you comment on whether that program is at all significant or why you made that decision? So, uh, one of the tests I did for performance was take out all the ticks right at the back end. So, you, you, you incur the cost of your lack of optimization opportunities, but you don't actually do the increment at the end. 70% uh, of the overhead is the uh, missing the optimizations, and 30% of the overhead is the increment. So it's a, it's a smaller part of the overall overhead. So you could sort of shrink that 30 down to maybe 10 by doing a bit vector update. But, but uh, we wanted to actually have that numbers for, for follow-on projects, so the overhead was relatively instable, maybe 20%. It, it was a choice. Any more questions? Uh, the, the question was: Is it is it uh, was it derived from the profile, or was it necessary no, to? Couldn't you derive from the profile information? So the original design of HPC, uh, we needed a way of getting coverage uh, for our, our requirements for a particular project. The original idea was use the cut, use the, uh, the profiling information. Now it wasn't designed for that, so it's not completely accurate in places, uh, but sort of by design. But you could use it, but only on a function by function basis. You wouldn't be able to get any sub-expressions, you wouldn't be able to get any branches. So we looked at adding cost centers everywhere and what would happen, but that seemed to incur a very heavy cost for doing that. So then a decision was taken, okay, let's go ahead, let's add the text, let's see where this leads. And we're quite, we're quite happy with where that led. But uh, it is complementary to the uh, uh, um, to the profile information. Yes. Can you say something about the memory overhead? Uh, it shouldn't have any memory he overhead apart from. Uh, oh, so so the size of the tape, the size of the number of ticks. So uh, you may have a, uh, that file with um, maybe a hundred lines may have a less than a thousand tick boxes, maybe five hundred tick boxes. Uh, total in 64 bits per tick box. That's the overhead. So, so it's, 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 like, it's constant by the size of the program. It's pretty small. Any more questions? All right, let's thank the speaker.